I'll record it on this computer. I'm recording it now. So uh, just so everyone knows it's being recorded. Right. So um, a good evening, everyone. And thanks for joining us for this talk about the wonderful Wax Caps of Wales with um, Professor Gareth Griffith from Aberystwyth University. And um, thank you, Gareth, for doing this for us. It's really, I'm really looking forward to it myself. Uh, so Gareth will talk for about 40 minutes. Uh, you can ask questions during the talk or afterwards we can um, have a question and answer session. Um, I'm going to briefly introduce our project first. But I'll try not to, um, I'll try not to take too long about that. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen. Can everybody see that? Yeah, great. So um, this project that we're running in Gwynedd is a bit of a pilot project with Gwynedd Council and it's called Malongwellt Malongwellt, which means wilder verges, better verges, um, less imaginatively in English, greener spaces and corridors. And it's part of a project we're running across Wales called Resilient Green Spaces, um, which includes all sorts of things like food hubs, community orchards, allotments, um, and exploring community access to farms and land and building horticultural uh, future farming skills. So there's a lot going on, and this is just a small part of it. And then um, if I can make it go to the next one. So this is an infographic about the Resilient Green Spaces project. Um, uh, you know, if you're interested in any aspects of it, uh, you can get in touch with us. Um, so what we offer under this pilot, the idea is that we give um, communities access to public green spaces um, to manage them as meadow habitat themselves, pollinators, or to have a say in how they are managed by the local authority or their community council. And we can provide all sorts of tools and machinery and advice and seeds and beautiful signs so there's a lot of support available and a part of it as well is um, uh, explaining to a wider audience the importance of changing cutting regimes in favour of biodiversity rather than uh, necessarily neatness. So this is uh, a sign that we produced that you might see around some public green spaces in Gwynedd um, with art by Rachel Porter, a local artist from the Clean Peninsula. And, uh, and these are some of the groups we're working with across Gwynedd. Um, but we have got uh, the capacity to work with more groups if anybody's interested. Um, so we're experimenting. We've bought some cutting equipment for different groups because on a small scale, it's quite difficult to manage grassland. You can't get the big machines in or you can't afford to get the big machines in. So we've um, bought a pedestrian brush cutter, scythe mower, um, and a sort of really beefy lawn tractor and trailer and it'd be really interesting to see how they work for groups in terms of managing small um, grassland areas as a meadow habitat. And when the council are changing their cutting regime they're in the 60 mile an hour zone outside municipal areas so they'll be cutting later and less often. They've also through the LNP got funding for cut and collect machines so they're going to be managing some large areas of verge really well doing cut and collect and, um, and some public green spaces as well. And they're using some seed collected by um, the Clean Meadows Group, Dollar Clean, uh, which is local provenance brush harvested seed from Joanna Porter, which is really fantastic. Um, and uh, the Welsh Government have launched their own campaign with very similar sort of aims. And um, they've got resources available. Their campaign is called Ithinu, it's for them. And that's their sign, um, which is very good, but not as beautiful as ours, I don't think. Um, and then uh, that's just our contact details. So that's me and Tywin Williams from Gwynedd Council Biodiversity Department and some more beautiful arts by Rachel Porter. So that's just a very brief run through of what this talk is a part of this wider project about um, uh, it, resilient green spaces in our communities. So uh, I will, oh, how do I stop sharing? This is not my forte, <laughs> as I think might be obvious. Stop share. There we go. Uh, so that's uh, that's that's what this is all about, really, and why I've asked Gareth to come give this um, really fascinating talk on wax caps, fungi, and meadows, so and grasslands. So Gareth, um, over to you. Sorry, just to interrupt, Sarah. There's a couple yeah, of people on. that would like to be promoted to panelists. When you have a minute to just oh yeah, sure. Revisit that. Okay, I shall do that now.
Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Brilliant. Thanks. If you if you um make it, you know, big, we'll still be able to see you, I think, down the side if you want to do that. I think it this is maximum. Is as as it is okay. It? Don't take my advice on Zoom. It's not my Yeah, you can you can cut and drag actually, I think maybe we can we as a as a well, I don't know. I, I can change my screen so the the images of okay. people are very small. Okay. Okay, uh, 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 I'm going to go to the I was going to talk to you about my stock title, a stock title I have, Wonderful Wax Caps of Wales, Capi Coir Campus Cymru. Um, and uh, I'm not sure what the, the I, whenever I give a talk to a new bunch of people, I, I'm never quite sure what level I should pitch it at. So um, if people start, if I say something technical, that people don't understand please stop me or stop me if you've got just any point of interest and uh, i'm very happy to be um interrupted if anybody wants to do that it, and then i'll uh, hopefully leave plenty of time at the end for um discussion so uh hopefully most of you because you've attended and you've um you know what a wax cap is which uh, would have been a less it might sound like a silly question but it, say 20 years ago it was a it wasn't really a silly question because most people didn't have a clue what wax caps were. Um, so uh, here's a picture of a nice blue wax cap. This is in Bala. This is there isn't uh, this is a variant of the green parrot wax cap. But you can see they're quite beautiful things. Um, and I thought I'd start by just giving you a bit of a history of uh, presumably our ancestors. These these fungi would have been very common in ancient grasslands or pastures. Um, so our ancestors would have been quite familiar with them, but they don't find much mention of them. Uh, so I thought I'd just mention that, you know, that we'll just go through the kind of history of human understanding of wax caps. But uh, the earliest naturalists who were writing stuff down sort of in the modern age, if you like, were in Germany. And they were usually um, vicars or priests. So you've got uh, this scarlet wax cap, Hygocybe coccinia here. I'm trying to work out if I can get people to put their hands up. Is there a way of doing that? So who knows what this is? I don't know if there's a, is there a hand up or thumbs up sign on your on Zoom. I'm not sure. Yeah, there is. There's a raised hand sign. Will I be able to see it? I'm just trying to think. <laughs> that would be a good idea if people have seen a red wax cap. This is unmistakable, really. This, this is quite a good drawing. This drawing is like 250. This painting is 250 years old, but uh, it's, it's 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 unmistakable. I think this thing. This is from, uh, this is from a, a book published in, uh, in Germany near Regensburg. It was a priest um, who, who, who first, uh, Jakob Schaefer, who first named this thing uh, Hygocybe coccinia, which is uh, shortly after Linnaeus had invented the whole um, Latin binomial naming system. I can't see any ha hands going, I can't see any hand up sign. I think yeah. people have put their hands up and then put them down again. <laughs> ah, all right, okay. <laughs> yeah. Lots of hands did go up. <laughs> was it a good smattering? So I'm, yeah, yeah. Right, I'm not too far off the mark then. I can see. I put my hand up and I can see. I could see about six. Ah, cool. All right. Two, all right. Okay, that's useful to know. Eleven of us. Um, then, uh, so that's uh, that's the uh, that sort of wax caps generally, and then because people didn't really start writing, you know, recording natural history very much uh, until sort of. Uh, 1750 sort of towards 1800 um because they could use common names i think that's what linnaeus did i know probably many of you uh, don't like latin names at all um i'm a big fan of them because i can talk to people in any country in the world and we're we know we're kind of talking about the same thing by and large the first person who did this in uh, in wales was a was another minister hugh davis and he wrote this book in 1813 called called welsh botanology it's actually not the botanology of Wales it's actually all the boss it's all about the botanology of Anglesey even though he didn't even live in Anglesey he lived in Abergwyn Gregin in the 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 vicarage that's still there with the amazing chimneys that some of you may be familiar with um and he talks about he's got the old Welsh names here Cowslefan that's a common Welsh name uh, frogs cheese oh, toads cheese Bwyd a kid that's less expected that's a kite food Bwyd a Llefan is fairy food um, so those last two names, I don't know where he got them from, um, presumably by asking 
asking what people call things, but they're, they're, those, those two names are either very localized in Anglesey or maybe they've died out of use. But then he talks in one page, he does mention a agaricus is the name that, um, that Linnaeus gave for any mushroom with gills, like a standard shop mushroom, which is still called agaricus. And um, so he was calling these wax caps agaricus um, citocinus, which is the parrot wax cap, the green one that maybe quite a few of you are familiar with because it's the only green mushroom you're likely to see. And it, it's fairly common as wax caps go. So he's got agaricus citocinus and a number of beautiful varieties, which presumably included all the other ones. Um, I've been around, you, you see, I don't, know, I don't know if any of you are in Anglesey, but Bod Golchad is near Shan Sadun, and Ken Koch is near there as well. And Anglesey, I've been, I've been to these pastures in the hope that the interesting fungi still persist there, but sadly, um, all, all the fields have been ploughed and reseeded with ryegrass, which is the, the modern plague, um, which is the main reason why wax caps are currently um, very rare uh, on a global level. We're quite lucky in Wales that uh, because there's lots of land that's difficult to plough for various reasons, um, they persist there. But I'll tell you more about that in a bit. So maybe I should tell you a bit. A bit. So one of the reasons I got into looking at wax caps and other grass and fungi was because it seemed obvious that we in Wales have an, a large amount of grassland, as you probably noticed. I assume everybody here is based in Wales, so uh, so uh, you also it's, it's a bit obvious to point out the large amount of grassland and not very much woodland around the place, um, and that's borne out by the figures as you can see here. Um, but we have to distinguish sort of grasslands because uh, these these sheep here they're in a field and that field's obviously been ploughed and reseeded with a a productive grass, uh, usually rye, perennial ryegrass. Um, Ironically, that's the, the organization I work for, well, Ibers, is the main people who breed ryegrasses and promote the plowing and reseeding of pastures. But there you go. Um, the result of that is that many, most farmers, if they've been able to plow and reseed grass, as they have done so, because it increases their productivity. Um, perennial ryegrass is very responsive to um, nitrogen fertilizer applications, so you get a much bigger yield, and therefore you get more sheep, which are a better weight at market. So the result of that is uh, less so in Wales, but in, in England and in sort of uh, southeast England um, or in lowland, lowland areas, nearly, you know, nearly all the fields have been ploughed. So the loss is more than 90%, it's probably more than 95%. And they've mostly been lost since, in, in the modern age, since it became you know, very cheap and accessible to have tractors that could plough. Farmers, when farmers had to horse plough stuff, they would think twice about which fields they would plow, because that was an awful lot of effort. So, um, so what, what we're looking at is wax cap grassland. So here's a view from sort of just below Chair Cayley, looking towards Pacheli. Um, and you can see this, this grassland here is undisturbed. It's what I would call an ancient grassland. Um, and then you've got some bog and fen areas down here. Um, but in between, you've got these fields that you can see they're noticeably brighter green. Uh, one of my friends calls this Fison's green, because Fison's make the synthetic fertilizer that gives you that green color. So those fields have been, they're essentially biodiversity deserts, whereas here is much more biodiverse. Now, most members of the public wouldn't really appreciate that because they go, well, they've both got grass in them. Um, but you'll find there's a much, much more herb rich here. There'll be many more plants in this field um, and in particular the soil organisms will be hugely more diverse and the most obvious of those soil, or soil organisms are the fungi that form mushrooms or larger fruit body we kind of technical term would be macro fungi um, i might i might use this term it's a rather ugly term it wasn't my fault um, it was my friend morris rothero who coined this term chegg d because this is the acronyms, they're the names of the families of the main groups of grassland fungi, the fairy clubs, Claveriaceae, the wax caps, the hygrophoraceae, the pink gills, Antilomataceae, the earth tongues, Geoglossaceae, and the cracked caps, Dermaloma species. So hopefully that wasn't... So if I say Chegg, the... otherwise I'm probably more helpful to say wax caps and their allies. 
Um, here's a picture of one particular wax cap. Now, Hygocybis citronavirans. All the all these species have got by now they have they have uh, common names in English and in Welsh, um, but I don't remember them. I find them a bit vague, so I I don't I I can't remember. This is a yellowy green species of citronavirans. They're kind of you know um, lemony coloured, I suppose, as the Latin name would suggest. Anyway, that's a moderately rare one, and you can see it's mostly westerly in its distribution. It's not particularly clear. Um, that's because these are the areas where there's less agricultural improvement gone on, or because the rainfall is high, um, or because it's, you know, it's just hilly, the topography of the areas where the, most of the dots are is, is, is quite hilly. Um, but then, slight exception to that, you can see down in Sussex, there's quite a lot. There's, Sussex has a lot of, there's a lot of wax cap fanatics down in Sussex. So you do get an element of recorder bias. So the more people who are interested in it, the, the more people who um, make records of this. So one of the reasons why I thought it would be a good idea to do this talk to you is that I might recruit one of you as a wax cap nut for the future, um, because there's always a shortage of people who are knowledgeable about these these fungi. Um, it can be quite, it's, it's quite fun. If you, if you want to be a, a wax cap expert, there's a lot easier than being an ornithology expert because there's loads of extremely skilled people in ornithology where there's the numbers of people interested in fungi are moderately low. Um, and I'd like to see that number increase. And now I was going to talk about biodiversity. This is the, the part of the uh, human induced uh, anthropogenic changes to the planet are leading to um, huge losses of biodiversity. Ecological meltdown, as it says here, or the sixth global, sixth mass extinction, extinction event. So in millions of years, whatever organisms live there will be able to look at the fossil record and see the damage that us and our ancestors, and hopefully not our descendants, but, uh, but that we are causing by mostly by, by habitat destruction. And uh, there are success stories you can uh, talk about in Wales and the red kites. Not so much, red kites don't seem to like North Wales. They, they, I, I, I saw one an hour ago outside my window here. So they're really common in Aberystwyth. Um, but as I go north from Machantleth, when I drive home to Carnarvon, which is my family home, um, I see fewer and fewer of them there. I'm not sure why that is. Possibly it's competition from buses. Anyway, um, you probably all know the story of the red kite and how that was reduced to maybe three or four breeding pairs that lived in the top of Cumhastwith, not far from here, um, and they were protected. Um, I think the person who I can't remember the I, I can't remember the name of the person who did it, but he he paid the local farmers not to shoot the red kites, and that mean they did that meant that this that Cumhastwith was the only place in the whole of the British Isles where they didn't go extinct, and from there those populations are built up, and now they're everywhere. You see, you you quite commonly might see forty or fifty. Um, altogether. However, so it's, that's lovely, that's brilliant, and it's uh, very fulfilling and nice to see them. Um, but if you look at the global extinction risk of the red kite, whilst it might have been threatened in the British Isles, it was never threatened globally. And if you go to countries like Slovakia, you'll see them very common there, and they always have been. They just weren't shot, you know, sh sh they weren't shot to near existent, near extinction, like happened in the British Isles. Um, so. The IUCN, the International Union of Conservation and Nature, has this scale, goes from least concern to extinct, the various categories. Um, I'm going to switch on that. I'm going to go to here and just point out that um, the giant panda and the snow leopard, we all know they're threatened by habitat loss and they're considered as vulnerable. What you don't aren't probably aware of is the fact that that citrine wax cap, like the citronavirans that I showed the map, the distribution map of, is also classified as vulnerable. And quite a large proportion of the global population of that fungus lives in the UK. And probably, if you notice the map, if I click back a few slides, you can see that most of the dots are in Wales. Which means that Wales is a global biodiversity hotspot for this and several other wax cap species. Um, Natural Resources Wales, are, and a few people there are aware of it, but you wouldn't see that reflected in their policies. I think the amount of funding provided for 
red kite conservation is probably 10, at least you know, 10, maybe 50 or 100 times more than all the fungal conservation efforts, um, which, which does show a, a sort of a, we have a global, um, we have a sort of an international treaty obligation to uh, pay attention to what the IUCN says, and that doesn't seem to happen as yet, but this is relatively recent. I've got these slides out of order because I was going to say the IUCN started to take note of fungi comparatively recently, and the UK is rather behind the game, and countries like Chile um, are ahead of us. And you can see here that the Chile, Chilean Ministry of the Environment, um, they, they don't talk about flora and fauna only, that's just animals and plants, they talk about flora, fauna and fungi. So they're, they're aware that you have these three kingdoms of organisms that are in need of conservation. So the fact that the IUCN, we might be behind the game in the British Isles at the moment, um, things are advanced and I should pay credit to the people who uh, helped get us to where we are. And uh, in particular, a friend of mine, Maurice Rothera, who sadly died um, 15, just over 15 years ago. Um, he, he was amazing. He was the one who introduced me to wax gap. So I was make sure in every talk that I thank, thank him for that. Um, he knew about wax gaps because of this guy, who's a Dutch guy, Eve Arnold. And this is Eve when he came on a visit to North Wales um, a few years ago, um, because the Netherlands have trashed their natural, hab ha nat natural habitats even worse than we have. And he reckoned there was only about 200 hectares of wax cap grassland left in the whole of the Netherlands. Um, and that was going back 20, 30 years. Another person who deserves credit is a man called David Bortman, who's Danish. Um, and he wrote this book called The Genus Hygrocybis. So this is like a, if you like the Bible of the wax caps, um, it means that anybody has that copy, they use the same names to describe particular fungi. And that's really important. We need to be singing from the same song sheet um, when we're recording nature. And he, he permitted that with this very accessible book. I think it's about 30 or 40 pounds. I'm not sure if it's still in print at the moment, but that's, that's a really good one. Um, and then you've got other, this is where I would, with me and various other colleagues, and you can see we're a very international bunch. There's people from about, well, you can see Japan, Hungary, USA, Sweden. It's, it's international, maybe 20 countries represented there. So we, mycologists, we work at, at, glo at a global level. That's why we took, because you have a global extinction risk. Um, so that's, we, we, this is a bunch of us here. We're doing DNA sequencing to work out um, how all these different species were related to each other um, so that they fitted into natural groupings. Equally important was uh, the process of awareness raising. It's kind of what I'm doing now, talking to you. Hopefully I'm aware, you had some awareness from the little straw poll I did earlier, and hopefully you'll have more awareness when I finished. Um, and this gives an example of um, the pink wax cap. So I do a stick your hands up if you know, if you've heard of the pink wax cap, or sometimes called the ballerina. Now I have to ask how many hands are going up. At least 10, 12, oh, it's going oh. up all the time, about 50. Brilliant. That's, very, that's very pleasing. Yeah, about half. That's, that's cool, one, that's brilliant. That's the pink one. Yeah, mm -hmm. my granddaughter found one recently. She's only seven, so you might have a budding mini enthusiast coming along there. I'm very excited. Oh, brilliant. They encourage brilliant. her. Um, yeah, that, that, again, it's the only, because the I, I, I view the, 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 the wax caps are like, if you like, the, the film stars of the fungal world, and then lovely and colour-coded, which makes it kind of easier. So if I talk about the pink wax cap or the green wax cap, you know, if you've ever seen one, you know what I mean. Uh, there might be more there's there's more than one type of red one which is the first one i showed but uh, that one i showed was the it's the reddest and it's the commonest of them um anyway the pink wax cap if you look at the number of records here in wales you can see um there was very little happening hardly any records fewer you know this is in single figures all the way up to 1996 when david bortman published that wax cap book and other things happened at the same time but you have this huge peak here uh, the charity Plant Life also were helpful in that they did some publicity. Um, and then I think, I, I suppose after 2000, people got a little bit bored. I'm not sure what happened there, but it's continually being, you know, a lot of people were seeing it 
not necessarily reporting them. Because you have to have a bit of confidence to know, well, there's knowing how you, for example, you're the, the little girl who was just mentioned earlier, um, how, how would she go about reporting something is, is, is uh, not so straightforward. I think plant life have got things moving. They've got something called the wax cap. I think it's an app. I'm not 100% sure if it's running this year, um, but that's a way that people can take a photo of a, of, a, of a wax cap and it reports its location from the phone and also logs the species name, I think. I wonder, anyway. if, I wonder if you can do it on the Lurk Wales um, app as well, which I've just recently downloaded and not learned how to use yet. But that, that's um, like Covnod, our local yeah. record centre. Um, it, like all all the local record centres are part of it, but um, I'm mm. kind of wondering if it might be worth running an event about how to do recording. Um, yeah, you know, of any sort, any species that people are interested in. So um, I might ask you all later if that's something that you'd be interested in. I use an app called Seek. I think it's American. It uses artificial intelligence to get its ID skills better and better. I think it would probably identify the pink wax cat. It's not brilliant overall on fungi, but it, it probably would do that because of the distinctive colour. Um, and I think that records the data. Because ultimately you want to get it to places like Covnod and then it goes to UK records and it ends up on the... If you look on GBIF, GBIF is a global... That shows global distributions of different organisms. It suddenly reminds me, I could, I could just fire that up later and you can have a look at how it works. Um, I've, I've just looked up on Plant Life. Actually, the uh, the Wax Cap app is still active. Um, I will post the link in the uh, question and answer. So if anyone's interested, um, uh, they can follow that link to do any recording. If you're taking a photo, I think Wax Cap asks you to take a photo. If you see the photo I've got there, it's always it's useful to see a photo from above and below of any mushroom you take a photograph of. So you can see that there's one left in place then, there's two being picked and put on their sides. Someone's asking, Gareth, or is Sliver Nate App and Gamrai got a punk? Oh, do they mature? Um, yeah, no, I've been a wife. No. Sliver Yola Williams, I'm sure this is a cap here, Huir and Hunna. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure. Also, um, this is my, my friend Gary Easton, who used to work, live in Aberystwyth, he's moved to Devon now, but. Uh, you can see we made a hat, um, which was quite, well, it's to, it got kids' attention, as you can see. Uh, it was actually quite dangerous to wear because if you turned your head too quickly, you probably give yourself, you pull on the muscles in your neck because of the uh, momentum of it. So I still have the hat somewhere. It's in, a, it's in the cupboard under the stairs. I haven't dared <laughs> wear it for a while. Um, the other thing you get is you get, if it, what's good to get if you get publicity in the, the UK press, uh, so here you got something from the Times. Um, so it's less less reputably is the, the Daily Mail here. Um, but there's John Bailey. I knew John Bailey from when I was quite young. He was a plant pathologist working at Long Ashton. And when he retired, he got bored of the little fungi that kill plants and became interested in the larger fungi on the lawns. So I think this is, um, oh, I've forgotten the name of the place now. Um, Tins Tintersfield in Bristol. So these lawns, because they've been mown not fertilized, not disturbed for many years. They're ancient grasslands and they have diverse populations of wax caps, maybe 20 different species. And you, because they keep the grass quite short, um, it's really obvious that they're there. Um, I did, this is my contribution to it, that talking about um, these articles and things like New Scientist, an American magazine called The Slate, um, and so forth. I was, I was just trying to make the point that um, it's not just the macrobes, the animals and the plants, that need to be conserved, that the microbes also need to be conserved. Um, and then most of the response I get was that if mushrooms were a bit warmer and cuddlier, then people would care about them more. Which I think is a problem for plants. Um, the... I really like it though. You know that when you, you know, you showed that picture of the ryegrass field and the unimproved field. And I really liked when I'm out and about to think about all the life that is that you can't see you know that's under the ground that's like quite a magical thing isn't it whereas with a, a sort of improved feel it, it just feels a bit sort of you know like there's not a lot going on uh, yeah. so i don't know if we it, it'd be good to get people more interested in the unseen world you know of all the things that are going on under the ground it's quite it's a, a whole hidden world isn't it 
yeah, well, that's why I think that the, the wax caps are a good sort of uh, entry entry point to that because they're quite visible and colourful. Um, uh, uh, to be honest, I think it would be more difficult. If you had some very rare bacterium, that would be very hard to get people to engage with that, possibly. Um, but in case I forget to say it, that with those fields I showed earlier, um, if, if you you know the the Welsh government at the moment is 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 telling people to um, plant trees everywhere, there's quite the danger that they get in doing that. If unless they do their screening very carefully, which I, I worry that they're not doing, they will destroy um, lots of important wax cap sites. Um, if, of those fields I showed, the ones they should be putting the trees on for, so if you like, ecological benefit or for carbon capture benefit would be those ones that have been ploughed. Um, because that would actually capture carbon in the soil. Because when you plough a field, you lose carbon. The carbon is respired. That's, what, that's, what, that's the point of ploughing the field, is you decompose um, the organic carbon. It releases nutrients, and that's why the grass grows more. Um, whereas in the upper field that was... Uh, much less fertile. Um, that's the one that makes less, less money for the farmer, and that's where the farmer is, is likely to want to plant trees because they get more. They can make money out of that field um, more by planting trees than by grazing sheep on it. But that's the one that's likely to have the biodiversity in it. Mm. Now so, is definitely the time to be making a fuss about that because the MRW yeah. has just advertised for national forest officers six throughout Wales to mm. like implement that national yeah. forest scheme. Yeah, we're working away on this, but the, the, 30, the 30 or so people here can uh, hopefully we'll get the message. If, if you have an ancient grassland um, that's already holding quite a lot of carbon, pe pe people often think the carbon, ca carbon sequestration is all about the vegetation that you see above the ground, but that's only about a third of, of, the, of the carbon in a field. So obviously with a field of grass, there's not a lot of carbon above ground, but there's, there's an awful lot below ground. And if you go and plant trees, um, you're not going to add to the carbon very much. Um, and there's a danger because trees tend to dry out soils that you'll dry the soil out and that will cause carbon from the soil to be respired away. So I don't, the Welsh government didn't do their homework at all well on the whole process of that. They should be very careful about you know, where you plant trees. And unfortunately, it's going to be on those unproductive fields. Because the only fields that are left, as if you like ancient grassland, are the ones that were too far away or too hilly, you know, in, 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 for the farmer to actually plough previously. So they've always been, uh, you know, unproductive. Whereas where they should be planting trees is on the more marginal lands that have been ploughed that shouldn't have been. Anyway, that's my uh, little sermon there. But hopefully that that's a very important point. Um, that hopefully, I, I don't think is being made by Welsh government. Um, I have a feeling it's because the I think it's the. Um, the forest, the foresters who are part of NRW are very keen to do this, and um, and but they don't know much about you know the habitats other than other than woodlands and grasslands are, as I'm hopefully convincing you today or this evening, um, are a very important reservoir of biodiversity, and those reservoirs are of global importance. There's no organism, there's no other organisms in Wales apart from these grassland fungi that where Wales is a, a global biodiversity hotspot. Anyhow. If you want to get make any progress, you have to have a legislative framework, which we kind of have with SSSIs and so forth. Um, you also need to have robust evidence of decline, which we are acquiring. Um, that's been difficult for, for, for ornithology, for birds. People have been recording birds for a century or more in good detail. So they have lots of evidence of the decline that have happened of lapwings and curlews and so forth, which are also, they're inhabitants of ancient grasslands as well. Um, so you need those, those things to raise the concerns and be able to do something about it. You then need some advice about how to um, promote the conservation of the organisms you're concerned about. Hopefully I'll, I'll give you some of that shortly. I'll mention a little bit about uh, that we also need to understand the ecology of the organisms we're trying to conserve and their habitat requirements. And lastly, a bit about the methodologies. How do you work out where they are? Because that's really the first thing you want to do is you want to survey all the grasslands and work out um, where the wax caps, if you like, you know, where the ancient grasslands are. Um, I'll show you a, a success story here. This is a quite a critical case. I think if um, this is well, this is the Llanishan Reservoir in Cardiff. So it's, a, it's a salubrious suburb of northern Cardiff, and this used to supply the water for the city um, in the sort of till about fifty years ago, I believe. 
Um, now the water for Cardiff comes from up in the hills near Brecon, and this reservoir is now redundant. It's used for sailing, sort of as a, people go dog walking, take their dogs around there, and so forth. Um, but the reservoirs are above ground level, so it prevents, presents a slight flood risk. And uh, Welsh Water, who owned it, or Western Power rather, who owned the site, were quite keen to drain the reservoir and then build houses on the empty reservoir, which would have made them, I don't know, about 50 million, well, comfortably 50 million quid. Um, unfortunately for them, the embankments of the reservoir, these grassy areas you could just about see here, it's not. It's only about six hectares. That's about 14 hec 14 acres um, of grassland around here um, had an awful lot of wax caps on it. The reason, one of the reasons why it had the wax caps is that the, there's something called the Reservoirs Act, which obliges anybody who runs a reservoir to um, mow the grass on the slopes of the embankment so that you can see if there's any leaks. So accidentally, they provided the ideal conditions for wax caps to a flourish in the soil and b um, to make lots of mushrooms in the autumn so when we surveyed this site we found a total of 28 species of wax cap which is an exceptionally high number there's only about 40 in the whole of the british isles so on the basis of that uh, countryside council for wales which is predecessor of nrw um, notified the site as a site of special scientific interest Western Power obviously not very happy about that because it meant they couldn't build all the houses. Uh, so they put forward a legal challenge, a, ju a judicial review um, in 2006, uh, which went all the way to the High Court in London. Unfortunately, Mr. Justice Collins, as you can see there, um, ruled in favour of CCW. And um, that was aided by, um, for example, having some, you had obviously the people here are quite well organised. They're quite, they're quite clever people who live in these big houses here. Um, they had the Save Our Reservoir campaign. Um, this is Julie Morgan. She's the widow of Roger Morgan, who's the first minister. So they had some quite um, influential supporters as well. So that was really good news. Had this decision gone the other way, I suspect I wouldn't be here giving you this talk tonight. Um, closer to us, I assume most of the people here from Gwynedd and not far from, would know where Cae Brewers, um, where Friars is, New Friars and Ascokai Top. When they were building Usko Kai Top, um, they were going to take quite a large area of Kaibri, so Brewery Fields, or uh, Athenog, um, for the school. Um, but uh, Meredith at Plainath, who's an ardent mycologist who lives nearby, um, had noticed all these fungi um, and was also concerned about the fact that this, uh, if you like, ancient grassland area was going to be destroyed. Um, so we, we went to CCW at the time and said that this should be also notified as an SSSI and various surveys and assessments of the biodiversity were undertaken. You can see at the time the headmaster of Eskul Kaitop wasn't particularly pleased because uh, he wasn't going to be able to build the, house, the, the, the school he wanted to. Um, in the end, as you probably know, they built a, the school, the, the, the footprint of the school on a Thinog is smaller, so now you have classrooms and mushrooms. But it kind of made for a good headline at the time. Um, right, I'll move across the border here to another important place. Um, this is us trying to understand about wax caps. Uh, I, I forgot to tell you earlier that Llanishan Reservoir was built in about 1868. So basically that was ground, that was year zero, if you like, for the wax caps there. So to get the 28 species took about 150 years. Um, which is quite a long time. It's much more slow. Wax cats are much more slow to recover than populations of wild plants. And I think if people manage things sort of better, if you like, but I think if we managed grasslands differently, I think lapwing and curlew populations would be back to their former levels much more quickly than 150 years. Sadly, I'm not sure if that's going to happen, but uh, it shows that these things are very slow growing organisms. They're very long lived organisms. I think people imagine that the the organism, a wax cap, is just a mushroom that pops up. But there's about that's about 1% of the biomass of the organism. You've got this huge amount of mycelium in the soil. So it's easier to imagine a, a mushroom. You know, when you see a plant in flower, if you picked off all the flowers and weighed them and then 
dug up the rest of the plant and weighed that, that would be about you know, less than 1% of the biomass would be flowers and 99 point something percent would be the leaves, the stems and the roots. It's the same with fungi. So you have to remember that. And some of these things are longer lived than we are. Um, it's difficult to find evidence for that. The organisms that are longer lived than we are present a challenge because we've got to find out what some dead people did. So here I'm going to um, a field in Hertfordshire near St Albans and it's a very famous field called Park Grass and it's at Rothamsted Research Station. It's the world's oldest field experiment. It was begun in 1850 by two guys called Gilbert and Laws. Gilbert was the scientist, Laws was the landowner um, and their main interest was in um, trying to get agriculture to be more productive. So here's the field and you can see all these squares they applied lots of different treatments. The treatments they applied then would be things like you know, guano, that, like the nearest thing they had to synthetic nitrogen fertilizer like we use now um, back in the 19th century was guano, um, which is you know, basically uh, bird poo that was imported from places like Chile and various other uh, parts. You know, it was quite expensive um, and it had to come from a long way away. So they would try that, they would try lime. There was all sorts of different, there was superphosphate they used. Um, but um, what they were worried, what they were concerned about, one of the big questions they had was they knew that nitrogen was in the air. So we know the air is 80% nitrogen, 20% oxygen by and large. Um, and they knew that nitrogen got into the soil. And we know that nitrogen is important for nutrition of us and plants. And they were aware of things like that beans, you know, that legumes could, um, they seem to be able to obtain nitrogen from the air. But they weren't sure how they did that. Now we know that there are bacteria called rhizobium that form nodules on peas and beans on the roots and do that. But initially, these people, it sounds really silly speak, you know, talk about it now, but Gilbert initially thought that it was the mushrooms that were fixing the nitrogen. The reason he thought that was on the plot so they didn't add any fertilizers, they had loads of wax caps. You can see here, he talks about the, the meadow wax cap the red wax cap I showed in the first picture, the white wax cap, um, and so forth. And he also mentions a fairy club here. Okay, so this is the early, this is from 1874. Um, and the person they got, because they, he was a, an agricultural scientist, he got Reverend Miles Joseph Berkeley, who was the, he was the founder of the British Mycological Society. He was also the guy who worked out that there was a a fungus or a fungus-like organism that caused the potato blight in Ireland, that caused the famine in 1846 onwards. Okay, so they, they list these species. This is a tremendously, va tremendously valuable piece of information. I didn't, the first time I went to park grass, I didn't know about this. It was when I went there and I talked to one of the people who ran the site and he, he gave me the paper where they mentioned this. Because the first time I went there in 2003, I didn't find any wax caps because it was a very dry autumn. Now I wouldn't have gone again had he not provided me with this paper. And then I thought I'll go in 2004 and I found tons of wax caps that year. However, including the ones I found with this one, Hygocybe punicea, crimson wax cap, I think is the common name. I think again, that's a fairly obvious wax cap, but you can almost see it. You can see it in a field, you can do drive by mycology because this is so big and so distinctive in color, you can, you can, I can often spot them in a field when I'm driving past, which you can't say for most fungi. Um, anyhow, you can see the only place I find, found Hygostibi punicea was here and here. And of the whole experiment, these are the only two plots where nothing is added. So none of this area has been, this area was actually plowed in about 1800 because um, there was a huge, because uh, the UK was at war with France, sent, you know, from 1790 for about 20, 25 years, and there was a huge demand for food and so forth. So this area was ploughed, but then it wasn't ploughed since then. And then in 1850, it reverted to a hay meadow. So it was becoming, it was reverting to being an ancient grassland. Anyhow, um, now into, in the 2020, or in 2005, when I, 2004, when I first found this, there was lots of Hygocybe punicea, and there was an awful lot of it. About 70 kilograms a hectare. It was like there was dozens of mushrooms there. You can see like these are only fairly small plots. 
you know, about the same size as my garden, a bit, bit bigger than my garden, each of them. And I found 70 of these quite large mushrooms on them. If you notice here, these guys didn't notice that mushroom. And that's because it wasn't making, it wasn't there. Okay, so 60 years, 60, 70 years after this had become hay meadow, having last been ploughed, this fungus wasn't there. Because it's such a big, obvious fungus, I don't think a bunch of clever scientists would have missed it. They would have seen it because it's very obvious. So it wasn't fruiting there. So it takes at least 60 years before, um, before this thing from the spore will make a mushroom. Possibly takes quite a lot longer. Unfortunately, between Gilbert going and doing this survey and me going in 2004 onwards, um, there was only one record from the 1970s um, of this fruit body, of this fungus. So we don't know. So we, we, can, we can kind of say it's somewhere between 60, 70 years and 150 years. It takes for these things to establish and produce the mushrooms, reach maturity. Right, so here's a picture of park grass. And that's near St Albans there. Um, I'm not sure, if some of you who do some nature recording might be aware that in the British Isles, um, nature recording is done based on vice counties. So I think this is the old vice county of VC20 is Hertfordshire. And you can see this is the number of records. There's one record of Hygocybe punicea. So that's the one from Park Grass from uh, the lady who found it in 1970 was there. But if you look around all the other counties, Middlesex, none, Essex, none, you actually have to go, so there's none here. Look, I think that's, is that Bedfordshire? I'm not sure. Um, you have to go about 50 or 60 kilometers in any direction from park grass uh, to find the nearest other Hygocybe punicea colony. So when I talk about these things being globally rare and having declined hugely, I think this makes the point quite nicely because uh, in this part, of, there's millions and millions of people here. Um, there's probably an awful, there's probably quite a high density of good mycologists. And for nobody to have spotted a massive red mushroom that's totally distinctive in all this area, they're very surprising. So I think it's gone extinct. Whereas, say, 150 years ago, in here, this is just an app. This was just an average piece of Hertfordshire grassland, and this, you know, only in the plots where no fertilizer was added did you find this fungus and a range of other wax caps. So hopefully, uh, hopefully, I've succeeded in making the point. That these things, you know, we've done a lot of damage to these ancient grasslands and their inhabitants. Um, this just shows the design of um, of park grass. I'll move. On. I'll just quickly. Um, so this is, this is us with a GPS. Um, just one of those accurate GPSs, and you can see, you can see where the, the I think the per, pink triangles are the Hygocybe punicea. So you can see this concentration here. These areas here are a wax cap desert. These are the, all the plots where lots of fertilizer was added. This is farmyard manure here. So even farmyard manure contains a high content of Phos of, of, of nitrogen. So these, the reason why the wax caps disappear is because they can't tolerate high levels of nitrogen. Maybe the nitrogen, different forms of the nitrogen might be toxic to them, or maybe it helps their competitors so they can't compete, and that's how they go extinct. This is based on mushrooms you find in the top thing, and here's a graph um, showing, uh, sh this is based on eDNA data, this is DNA data. So by using DNA, we, we can actually look in the soil and see if the mycelium is there. Right, I think um, this is getting, this is the slide that's probably closest to what Sarah was asking me to talk about, um, which was about how you manage grasslands. Because if you want to manage for wax caps, you, this is kind of important advice. So hopefully you've got the drift that you, you, you mustn't plow your grassland up and you mustn't add anything in terms of fertilizer to it. Um, I think a very occasional lime application is acceptable, but not too much. The kind of the, the, the wax caps get knocked back by lime addition, but they recover. They seem to recover within a few years from that. But the thing people mostly think of when they talk about think about wax caps is the um, is the great is the is the management of the grass. 
and, pe and people often worry, they think they have to cut the grass really short all the year round, which then creates a bit of competition because if you do that, if you cut the grass really short for the whole year, you're not going to see any wildflowers, you're not going to see many invertebrates, spiders and butterflies and this type of thing on the field. So we were concerned about this because we thought um, that managing for wax caps was incompatible with say orchids or you know wildflower meadow. So we did a mowing experiment. I had to go and buy a ride on mower and this is my friend Kevin Roderick who's doing a PhD with me. Um, and we cut, this is a field up in Bala. There's a guy, a, a man called Andrew Graham. I don't know if any of you know him. Um, he lives in a farm called Chauskoi, just above Llanuchlin. And he had, he had a field that had lots of wax caps in. And he, was, he was willing to let me sort of take over the field and do some strange lawn, lawn mowing things there. Um, so we cut some, some plots. We had five replicate plots on here. And we had all these different treatments on there. So we cut some plots from about late April onwards to three centimeters. So that's about just over an inch. Other ones to eight centimeters, just under three inches. Um, and then one plot, we didn't cut it until late July. And then we cut it down to three centimeters. And similarly, so we, when we took the hay away. In all these plots, we took the, we took the cuttings away. And here's one where we cut for hay and then left it at eight centimeters. And here's one where we did a super late hay cut and cut down to three centimeters. So what you can see here is that the best treatment was the leaving it till late July and then cutting the grass short, which is brilliant. You don't, if I was wanting to fix this result, this is the result I would have chosen because that's the one that's most compatible. That if, if any land managers, anybody here who's looking after a nature reserve, um, they'll be overjoyed to hear that. Um, they don't have to choose either wax caps or wildflower meadow. You can have both. Oh, Gareth, I can't read the, what's it say on the side? Mean number of... Um, Tegby, the Tegby is that horrible yeah. acronym I mentioned yeah, earlier. Yeah. It's the wax caps. Per, per plot. Yeah. And there's, a load okay. of, there's, there's, there's one plot there. Um, and you can see that uh, Kevin is busy mowing one plot. There were, I can't remember, the five, tw 25 plots we had to do. It got really tedious doing this. You can see <laughs> down the bottom here. You yeah. can see the bottom corners. You can see the different plots there. And can this I ask as well, well, you know, if you've got a grassland and it's got a bit out of control because it hasn't been mown or grazed for a long time, yeah. Will the, uh, um, what are they called, mycelium, uh, persist? And then if you start cutting it every July and, and collect, they oh, will yeah. start flowering again. Yeah, very good point. Um, I could tell we got some good evidence just recently from down in Cardiff. Um, that Clannishan Reservoir, we've done lots of the, I won't mention the details of the eDNA work because I don't think I've got time. Um, but um, we did some eDNA work there. There's an area that used to be embankment that got overgrown with trees for maybe 10 years. Um, and they cleared the trees recently because that was part of the SSSI requirement. Um, because Western Power, even though it's an SSSI, they're, they're a bit grudging about how they manage it. They don't manage it particularly brilliantly, so they have to be told off all the time. Um, but I think it was 10 or 15 years of having lots of trees growing on there. And um, when they took the trees off last year, this year we did the eDNA, and all the species were still there, but they were just in very low amounts. So they hadn't gone extinct from the plot. They were just declining. You could see they were on a decline. Right. But they could persist for quite a long time. So what, you know, what the, um, obviously we all know uh, what role a flowering um, plays in plants reproducing. But, yeah. I mean, with, with a lot of wax caps, like, you know, the um, earth tongues and stuff, it's hard to see how they're, where the spores are and where the gills are and you know they don't look like a normal mushroom do they so do the, the wax caps need to flower to to sort of grow bigger they need yeah, to the fruit. long term yeah yeah i guess like the life the life of a a wax cap as i say that crimson wax cap would be you know it's it's like a juvenile it's not it's immature for say about 60 70 maybe 80 years then it's got big enough it's got it's built up enough biomass over those 80 years to then start to pop up mushrooms right um, and then those mushrooms fly away I, I imagine that you know a mushroom might produce you know a billion spores 
of what you know and the chances of, of them you know, the great great majority will will come to nothing but a few will establish yeah it's similar with orchids isn't it the seed is so tiny they, they produce a lot of it but hardly any of it kind of results yeah. in more orchids but and then orchids um you know interact there has to be certain fungi for orchids to grow doesn't there different orchids are related with different fungi species is that yeah yes they do yeah yeah, yeah. so the um yes they seem to be not not massively fussy they do need fungi basically they're a parasite you know that well what they do is that the, the, the reason the reason orchids make teeny seeds they're about 10 micro 10 micrograms i'm trying to think how many that is to the that's about 100,000 to the gram of seeds they make teeny seeds so just like fung fungal spores they pile them high and sell them cheap um so the only reason they can do that is to have very little food reserves. So when the seed germinates, it, the first thing it needs to do is to grab a fungus. Um, and then the fungus sustains it until it gets big enough to pop up a couple of leaves. And then it pays the fungus back for its good turn by supplying sugar to the fungus. So the fungus, what nutrients do the, does the fungus supply to the orchid? But every, initially. Everything. The baby orchid, everything. Yeah. But then when, when the orchid has got leaves, um, then the orchid can supply sugars back to the back to the fungus and the fungus will provide some phosphate and some nitrogen, just like a normal mycorrhizal mutualism or symbiosis. Yeah. And are all mushrooms the same? Are they, have they all got related plant species that, that provide them with sugar? No. Yeah, well, <laughs> there, are, there are things like, you know, uh, fly agaric and chanterelles they're famous examples of uh, mycorrhizal fungi i've been trying i'm i'm convinced i've got loads of evidence that again not much time to show you um that that wax caps and various grassland plants have an association very similar one a mycorrhizal type association um because wax caps are so difficult to work with it's been very difficult to provide to generate the evidence that will convince my my, co my fellow mycologist colleagues that this is really the case you kind of know that scientists are supposed to be super skeptical so you know that if i go up and say here's a bit of evidence they'll go but what if so i think that's the case but i also am aware that i need to find the evidence to do it which is quite difficult to do because you can't get any money to do that type of research right yeah um there's a couple of questions in the chat i don't know how oh. near the end of your um i was going to stop fairly soon i've got to the more the more technical bit. Um, I wasn't going to talk about the uh, the eDNA and the, all the nutritional ecology stuff. Um, maybe if I just if I just click on that just to follow that point and make this my last. But I've got three slides left. That one just well, just because it follows from the point you made. But our wax gets mycorrhizal, so we can if we look inside the roots of plants near mushrooms, you can see inside this teeny root. You've got like a little hypha. So this, that's ten micrometers. That's a hundredth of a hundredth of a millimeter. So this is a very narrow root, and you can see inside it is an even more narrow hypha. And we could do some DNA work and prove that the fungus was inside the roots. So that would suggest it was mycorrhizal. Again, um, there's various other bits of evidence about. Um, we can look at isotope patterns. And they're exactly like you'd expect from mycorrhizal fungus. Um, I've already shown you how the fertilizers inhibit mycorrhizal fungi, as do they do wax caps. Um, it's a bit weird. When we killed, when we did an experiment, we killed all the soil animals by using a, um, a nasty, um, what do you call them? Organophosphate pesticide. It wasn't my experiment, but I just went to look at what they did. And there weren't any wax caps there. So the wax caps are associating with the soil invertebrates, it would seem. That's weird. We can't explain that. No, these, just... these, in, in terms of nutrients, that's all evidence. You'd find exactly the same for mycorrhizal fungi. And we can also show that um, carbon goes from the plants to the fungus. Um, we don't think there's very tight association. You know, it's probably, they're probably associating with a whole load of different plants. And if you kill the grass with weed killer, which is another experiment Andrew Graham was kind enough to let me do, um, you didn't get any wax caps fruiting. Sorry, I, I cut across you there. No, no, it's fine. I, I wasn't. Uh, I was just uh, wondering how deep 
the wax cap, uh, the, the underground part of the organism goes, you know, like with ploughing, yeah. disrupting it. Yeah. How, how deep are they? Well, usually if you, if you, if you, if you dig a hole, if you dig a hole, you'll notice the top, well, in most of Wales, you can't dig up, you, 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 the, the spade will hit rock. But very um, true. <laughs> um, if you dig a hole deep enough, what you'll find is the top, say 10 centimetres, is quite dark in colour. That's because it's got lots of dead plant material, organic matter there. That's where all the food is, and that's where all the life is happening. Then you've got lighter coloured soil below the subsoil. Um, there's much less food there, so you have much less life going on. I think the wax cats are pretty much restricted to the black area, the, the top 10, 15 centimetres. Yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? That I, I've always thought that they liked thin soils and low nutrient soils because they're so common in Wales, but it's more maybe to do with the grasslands having been improved more in, in other areas. So I'm asking lots of questions. Is, is anybody, would anybody else like to ask any questions? I think I've enabled everybody to speak. So if anybody wants to unmute and, and chip in with a question, feel free. May I? Flick to the last slide. <laughs> do the thank yous. <laughs> yes, go on, go ahead. Um, good evening. Thank you very much. Extremely interesting talk. I'm Rachel Auckland, coordinator of Keradigi on Local Nature Partnership, right. and uh, totally non technical, but wildly enthusiastic about these film star fungi. Um, so I, I've been popping a few questions in the chat. If I can just scroll back, shall I tell you them all or should we take them one at a time? How should we do this? I mean, I mean it's really, oh, sorry, I've seen them now. Yeah. I don't know if I, you I, I, wasn't, I was ignoring one. the chat. Um, yeah, well, I had a copy of that, that the book, the Bortman book, the Bible, if you like. Um, I had a copy of that that David Bortman sent me, um, the second edition, and, and one of my students nicked it. Which is a bit annoying. Um, and then I found it was out of print and I've told David it's out of print and he said he would send me another one, but that hasn't happened yet. Um, there is a guidebook. Uh, 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 some of you at least will have heard of David Harris. I was had had more R coding in his garage. Um, but the other thing that David does is he makes this book. If you look at I'm holding up to the screen now. Ah. This is brilliant. I think it's brilliantly understated. It's 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 got loads of pictures, descriptions. It's quite technically good. Uh, David is brilliant at doing this. This is this is about his fourth edition of this. This is superb. I've got I've got various. He sent me a wadge of copies here. I don't know if the, he has to. All he has to do is cover his costs. I think this might. If you ask him, he would send you, you know, ten copies for twenty quid or something like that. Yeah. Just it's more or less how, whatever it costs to print that nice colour. What's his um, name? Sorry, David Harris. David yeah. Harris. He, he lives in Freeze. just the other side of Pembro Pembroke in, in the village of Angle, on the Angle. I'd be delighted to be put in touch with him. I think it might be that um, members of Keradigi on Nature Partnership would be very interested to learn yeah, more about, about this. Pembrokeshire Fungus Recording Network, PFRN. Just write that in the chat. Yeah, they're actually quite famous. I think I had this. There you go. See that picture in the red here? Oh, yes. You know the new, what's it called? Have I got news for you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> that, they had their magazine in there. So you can see how they had as a reward for keeping his dung moist, Mike Crutchley, you know. Oh, um, um, yeah, when they have, they have the uh, publications, and you have to guess. Yeah. So they're famous. What, the words are, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what was the mm. answer? I can't remember now because of what I <laughs> I thought that was you need a bit you deserve respect for that, don't you? Definitely. That good. <laughs> Sorry, I'll go back to the chat now. Yeah, so that, that's what I would suggest as an alternative to Bortman. Um there's a cow's written about the plant life stuff. Yeah, plant life. Um Lizzie Wilberforce, who did a PhD with me. So you've got she she's I think she's running plant life company. Um she's really so she's aware of fungi. Um I think she was help, she was helping show the wax cap app to work. Um, and the wax cap app is based on something I wrote years ago. It was like a novice guide to wax caps, where even if you don't know the name of any wax cap, you can go and count the pink ones, count you know, see if you see red ones. You can sort of work out how many colours a wax cap you get, and that would give you a score for a field. And they used to be a fantastic fungal foray at Moila Key every year. 
and the, all the different coloured wax cups and mushrooms would all be laid out on a table at the end and all recorded. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, uh, I'm just working through from uh, how can we influence Welsh government? Well, yeah, I suppose. Um, yeah, it, 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 we haven't we haven't succeeded yet because they're still telling people to plant trees on marginal land without warning them not to um, you know to check if there's wax caps on there first. On the plus side, even if the tree you know when they plant trees, they don't the damage doesn't happen quickly. Um, so even if the trees are maybe ten years old, they can still be ripped out if the, if the wax caps are important in the field. So if you tell people that. Then they'll, you know, they don't want to plant trees and then have them ripped up ten years later. So they might take a bit of care about planting them in the right place. And I guess it's the the fields where where forestation should, you know, could happen. Are the fields that are quite hilly that have been ploughed um, by? But it's usually the son of a farmer who wants to prove himself to his dad. So he'll go and plough a very steep field or something like that, which is a very silly thing to do um, and dangerous. Uh, those are the fields where they could put woodlands they could plant trees because they might they might have win wax caps there but the plowing would have killed them off um so i don't yeah i don't know with influencing welsh government i uh, lizzie wilberforce and i we discussed this a lot how to do this um i think she, she's got in touch with various uh, uh, senate members as well who um who are concerned about these things so i think i think telling your local um a lot senate would be a good idea um, did Gilbert survey from cat mummies? I'm not sure. He was a very gifted person. Um, how did Hygus Ivy Panicia get to park grass? Um, those spores. That's how I would have got there. So I suppose that there's a rain of wax caps because they, even if there's only, well, we're lucky in Gwynedd because you could go, and I'm sure we're all sat within, you know, a kilometer of some Hygus Ivy Panicia, which is quite different from the situation down in the southeast of England. Uh, so we've got quite a dense rain of spores, and I suppose some of those spores get down to the southeast of England and might colonise if suitable, can, or maybe they already have, we just don't know yet. Does that answer your question, Rachel? Um, I, I think it goes a long way towards it. Um, I've had a long, hard day, and I'm, I'm, I'm wildly excited to hear you speak and just wondering what my next steps need to be. And I think it might be to invite you, would you be willing to, to give a, a, a similar talk to this to a meeting of means, the yeah, yeah. Nature Partnership at some point in the future? Yeah, by all means, yes. That would be wonderful. Fantastic. The there's questions and answers. Yeah, there's that, questions right? in the question and answers. How might one identify an ancient grassland is one. Yeah, well, the, the term, I have to admit, there was Lizzie who, Lizzie, you, you, the term ancient woodlands is quite, is quite widely used and they can just work out what's an ancient woodland by looking at old maps and seeing if there was continuous afforestation. There's quite a lot of what you might call ancient woodlands that aren't particularly uh, biodiverse. They're not particularly, you, know, you, you, you go there, you don't get a wow because they're, you know, there's all sorts of weird things there, um, but they're categorized as ancient woodlands. I think the best indicator of ancient grassland is if there are wax caps there. So the more if you see red wax caps, I'd say that was an ancient grassland. Not sure if all you know. I'm not sure if botanical colleagues would agree with me. There has to be an all-encompassing and simple reason why wax cap is important to health of the land. Um, it's just a, it's an indicator. Those soils will be vastly more biodiverse. When we do the DNA work on. You know, a few grams of soil, we'll find thousands of fungal species. And that's probably, you know, 10, 000, tens of thousands of bacteria. And then you've got all the soil and vertebrates. And lots of, if you think about lots of, uh, lots of the invertebrates we see flying about in the summer, they spend 90% of their life in the soil. So they're soil organisms as well. You've got nematodes, mites, there's a whole load of stuff. Um, for the health of the land, um, yeah, that, 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 that's, that's uh, I suppose it's just that we're, we're maintaining and preserving biodiversity, but to maintain and preserve ourselves, we have to, you know, our, our species has, has, has evolved to do agriculture and uh, the, the planet couldn't sustain 9 billion of us if there wasn't um, some agriculture and quite a lot of fertilizer. Um, but I suppose we're moving away from fertilizer and trying to reduce our footprint now. 
So we, we, people, you know, people are going to still use fertilizer in certain areas, but by and large on, on you know, arable land, I mean, I suppose it is the shift, it's probably the shift towards um, eating more plants, which means that reduces our footprint. Yeah, or, but also regenerative agriculture. I mean, we didn't always use fertilizers to grow grass yeah. for animals, did we? You know, no. cows can and sheep can graze in ancient grasslands and herb rich meadows. Hmm. Um, it's that, about um, intensity of production, isn't it? I think. Yeah, well, that's what farmers, you know, I mean, the, the, the habitat we have in Wales was created by, I suppose, our ancestors. Um, and they knew that you know I mean, a sheep is a very useful device because it goes up and it it feeds itself and it walks all the way down again you don't have it you don't need a tractor for that um and that if the the, the, the the to to maintain wax caps or these ancient grasslands you're going to need grazing as well so there's going to be some sheep production cattle production from from those upland areas and i suppose it is it's the when you see um sheep and cattle on lowland grasslands that were ploughed or could be ploughed you think well, those that land could be more productive for humans because there's no, you know, if it's ploughed, there's not going to be, you know, that that's a, I mean, ploughing is how we, you know, what we do there is steal the fungi, we steal the food away from all the, uh, all the the long lived fungi and bacteria and soil insects, and we just cause very rapid decomposition of the or dead organic matter, which then releases nutrients, which is what the plants. Do. And we also kill the weed, you know, ploughing also kills off all the weeds that so stops the competing like plants. Boom or bust cycle though, isn't it? How long is that sustainable for? How many, you know, before, I mean, ultimately it's, it's, it's you know, if there's no soil life left, you're just constantly having to put fertilisers in, aren't you, to feed yeah. the plants? Yeah, well, I suppose what I mean is an ancient grassland is one type of habitat and then a yeah. ploughed field is a different type of habitat that we create, you know, we, we yeah. kind of create both, um, but yeah. we have to treat... The, the ploughed field as a different habitat and if we want to you then have to you know if you if you if you plough fields year on year what happens is the organic matter decreases and decreases until the soil breaks it doesn't function anymore so you've got yeah. to have that fallow period what, um, you know, there's a, another uh, question i've come across a field in anglesey with many wax caps is there anybody i should contact and what should i say to the landown, landowner or farmer well alec yeah yeah um well, that's a hard question, isn't it? Well, I'll have to go back to the other questions. I've, I've just missed them, but I um, will take that one. Saying, you could send me, if you, if you sent me the details, I could see if I could pass it on. I'm sure there are other people in the audience who would also know. I mean, as, as to whether you tell the farmer or not, they might, you, you never could not quite know whether they'll appreciate the thing in the same way as you do. And they might think it's a worry that they might get, be restricted in what they can do to the field. quickly plough it. <laughs> I do think, if, I mean, I, 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 I sympathise it's like, I don't know if anybody, any of you live in a listed building like that, but uh, there you've got an obligation not to touch it and you don't get, you know, at your cost, you don't get any, you don't get any tax breaks or anything for doing, for, for treating the building nice. And I think a, fa a farmer has the same thing with an SSSI that there's, there's, uh, there's not necessarily a benefit to them. They should, that, that's, that, that's, that's where Welsh government should definitely change their policy and make it worthwhile, you know, make it more profitable to have an SSSI than, you know, whatever production they could get off the land if they destroyed the SSSI. Which kind of seems really obvious, but it still doesn't happen. Um, yeah, I don't know about telling the farmer. It depends if how enlightened they are. If, if you think they they like to preserve, if they sort of value nature, then that'd be a good idea to tell them. Um, otherwise, yeah. I mean, usually, usually farmers tend to the creatures creatures of habit. Um, I should point out that I'm the first person in my whole, of any of my ancestors ever not to be born on a farm. So, uh, like all my all my ancestors or, or farmers so i kind of appreciate their mindset um but um usually the farmer will keep on doing the same thing it's when there's a change of ownership or a generational change is when the management of a particular piece of land might change that's the worrying time it's so, quite it's quite hard to get an sssi uh, yeah. you know established isn't it i know Marade, it was a long hard slog to get that um yeah it was yeah you yeah. know Ethanog recognises an SSSI. So, um, but yeah, it's MLW that you'd contact for that, isn't it? Now, could show you that there was some, something I helped. Oh, sorry. Oh, it's here. I have to close the chat and things. I did do so. The Welsh, the Welsh government, there's, an, there's something called environmental impact assessment. So, it's this this is the, the Town and Country Planning Act, um, where if you change land use, 
you have to ask the permission. And it's the EIA unit in the Welsh government that come and have a look at the site. So if it's a long lived past, if it's an ancient grassland, basically, um, you need to have permission to plough it. Here's an example of a site down in Pembrokeshire. There's area A and area B. And you can see this area of horse pasture, Eastland, um, was surrounded, surrounded by you know, fields of wheat and, uh, and ploughed grassland and reseeded grassland. And suddenly this area ended up as a wheat field. And the farmer said it had always been a wheat field, um, which, which uh, a quick perusal of Google Maps would have shown them it wasn't. Um, but they asked me if I would, um, they, they, they didn't tell me, they just gave me two bags called A and B and said, tell, tell us about these. And I said that they were both, you know, the, you can see they were clearly different. This is a, the, well, it's, I won't explain the ordination map there, but uh, I found they were clearly different, but I could see that there were things like, uh, there were bluets and uh, a fungus that's associated with the roots of rushes here. So I said, that's not, if, that's, if, that was, if that's a wheat field now, it hasn't been a wheat field very long. And I think they used that in the evidence when they prosecuted the farmer. Mm. So they can do that as well. Um, like I said, it needs to be the, the, it needs to be working. With, there's very little benefit to farmers apart from their own personal interest. There's no money in it. This, and farmers are businessmen who have to turn a penny. Um, it's very difficult to um, it's very difficult to sell the biodiversity arguments to them. Yeah, which is understandable. Um, Gina and Holly question. Um, uh, just idea, oh, yeah. Mae David Harris yn defnyddio iawn. Os oes modd cael... Dwi'n siŵr bod PDF honno fawr gael efo allai. Mae Holly David heno. Ie, iawn, ok. Os mae yna, um, just anfon link, os mae'n bosib. Ie, yeah, na neithio na, na oedd i, I Sarah. Anfon i bawb. Um, so somebody's asking about churchyards. They often seem to be good wax cap habitat. What can we do to support sustainable management? Um, there are, there have been various uh, churchyard uh, projects. Um, and if it is in Gwynedd, we can help with um, putting a management plan in place and with all sorts of support. If, uh, but obviously, you have to have a, a willing volunteer group that are up for doing that, and you have to be, um, uh, you know, the church themselves have to be keen. So, yeah. well, there's some spectacular churches, especially the ones that the cemeteries where the graves are more recent because they're still tended, so they're managed slightly better than some of the old churchyards, like, I don't know, Llanbihanga Le Penant at the top of Cwm Penant, because the, the graves are also old there. You know, all the descendants of the people buried there are also dead, so it's, sort of, it's quite difficult for church of, the Church of Wales to, uh, to manage that. Yeah, they're very but, hard to manage because, you, you know, you have to cut around all the headstones and everything, but you? And it's certainly very difficult to take away the leavings. Yeah, they usually strim them, just give them one strim in the summer, don't they? Exactly, yeah. This, um, go on. Mick, oh, there's somebody called Mick, Mick Clifton, who runs an organisation called Caring for God's Acre. Okay. Has, has anybody heard of him? I have heard of that organisation, yeah. Yeah, he's based in Craven Arms, it's, it's, which is almost Wales, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I, do you know, I actually applied for that job, so I'm glad somebody got it, and I'm sure he's better at it than I am. But one of the requirements was to say, how would you develop the work in Wales? And I haven't seen a great deal of evidence of that, unfortunately. But I have oh. been working with, now then, there was a bio blitz in the south of the county a little while ago, and I'm just trying to remember, it was the county butterfly recorder. Um, yeah, who's... who's uh, be good all rounder, um, and so that yeah, the church where the bishop is terribly keen. Bishop of um, St David's is terribly keen, and I did have some contacts, but it's um, yeah, ah. knowing how to. What did you say his name was again? Sorry, Mick. Mick Clifton. He emailed me only last week, and because oh. I've got this method with the eDNA, so basically, I if you take a if you take some soil cores. So a soil, a, core, a soil core is like a, a fruit pastel tube sized bit of soil. I tell people if they go around a churchyard, if they, you know, if they take like about 40 cores around the churchyard and send it to me, we can analyze the eDNA. It's a little bit, it costs about 300 pounds for a sample, but we can tell people all the fungi that are there then. Wow. 
So it's quicker. I think it's actually quicker than finding an expert and getting them to go out a few times and see what they find. Would, would good photographs and amateur attempts at identifying them be any use to you? It's a little bit different. Sometimes it can be easy. For some species it would be quite difficult. Okay. Um, yeah, th th then that takes my, my time. The, 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 it's, it's kind of one of those things where the, you know, the, the technology sort of paradoxically ends up to be, the high-tech approach seems to be cheaper. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I spent ages if, um, to any piece of grassland, you know, if it's not been improved and you've changed the cutting regime to, you know, a July cut and taken the leavings away, yeah. that's going to work for whatever fungi are there and for the um, plant species as well. So that's, you know, it's worth doing wh yeah. whatever is there. That'll improve what's there, that's for sure. Yeah, and we've yeah. run doing something right in Flandaneal and also at um, St Ursula's in, in Flandigwith is where the, the, the pink uh, the ballerina. Oh I didn't know that yeah because it's, uh, yeah. it's always if I see an old church yet I always if I get if I get any, any time at all I stop and have a look. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, we've we've run over I'm not saying everybody has to go but I just wanted to say thank you to everybody for coming and anybody that does need to go obviously feel free. Um, yeah, yeah. Valve, yeah. yeah and, and thank you to you Gareth. It, um, mm -hmm for your time it's really fascinating but yeah if if people do have more questions feel free but also if people need to go that's fine obviously i see one one question i could ask from rachel about are there any wax caps on the abrustus university estate um yeah <laughs> good question they have the farms the university has lots of farms like chauskoid um that they man they always make losses off their farms um so the guy who's the farm manager he manages the place so intensively. There's there's hardly a scrap of a scrap of uh, yeah. wild soil anywhere. Yeah, I, I I've been asked to talk to them about how they can improve their biodiversity, and I'm fairly sure this would be you know. The I'll tell you what you could do. This do opens... I'm not an expert in anything, so it's how it's how to get that strategy in there. Um, uh, but they they've got a nice range of different. Um, altitudes and so on there must be some corners do you, you work with um marisha yeah well i did i i, I the push pay land the big yes. plots is where we did a lot of our work and i i had it cost me a load of money to stop those from being destroyed because nobody cared about them for about five years about 10 years ago so i had to pay you know because because i i was doing work on wax caps there already I had to pay for the management to happen because the head of the department thought it was a waste of time and he wanted to get rid of them. Ooh. So I managed to fight the rear guard action. And then I think then Han, Marisha's now got some funding to look after them. Um, one, right. one thing I could mention, which hopefully doesn't get me a P45, is the university has a farm up in uh, Cum Kailan above Ta Talabont. Uh -huh. Or read it on then. And they, they've got big plans. They've fallen for the Welsh government's um, planting tree thing. This is very organic, rich um, upland pasture. And I've told the person responsible that by the, the sustainability office, I said that they shouldn't plant trees on there because I was pretty sure there would be loads of wax caps on there. Oh. Um, he didn't listen. He's not listened to me at all. Oh. Um, so that would be a, some lobbying there would be appreciated because he, he just wasn't listening to me. OK, maybe we should take this conversation somewhere else. Could we do that, please, Gary? Yes, yes by all means. Well, I'm happy to publicise it because I think the university should have Right. What, what did Michael Gove say about what we don't need experts anymore with the university? That, that's their job. They employ loads of experts like me. You think they would listen to them, but they don't. <laughs> On those types of issues. Yeah, um, it's so. it's really difficult, I think, to, to ha for people to understand that, you know, if you're not passionate about it already, passionate about it, like fungi and all sorts of, you know, different aspects of ecology, a tree is a really... Um, you know, the big visible thing, isn't it? And everyone knows yeah. trees are good. And it's it's really a tough message to get through, I think. But although I have heard a lot of grumbling about um the natural forest. I think people are beginning to understand, but it's it's getting people to understand quickly enough for them to not plant trees on all the ancient grassland, isn't it? Is yeah, the, uh... the right place to plant the right tree. Yeah. And that that farm up in Cumcaylan is not the right place. It would they would actually cause you know they would they would enhance co2 emissions from that site if they were to plant trees there i'm pretty sure about that yeah which is the opposite of what they're trying to do i know it's I have really a feeling good. they're being tempted by the subsidy yeah 
which is then that counts as greenwashing, which I, I think it is everybody should disapprove of. Yeah, it's a, a long, long history of uh, misplaced subsidies in the uh, yes sadly, the environment yeah. in Wales, isn't there? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, Rachel, that would be very good to talk about that site more because I think they they probably listen to people from outside more than people from inside. Well, I was approached by that sustainability manager to mm. help with you know, putting in place the next stage, but only after the tree planting scheme had been announced and before I'd um, been privy to any sort of yeah. plans. So, um, yeah, not too late, though. Yeah, they haven't planted the trees yet. Like I said, you've got a good decade. It's more or less the, 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 the people who want the, the people who don't believe us now you have to point out they will be embarrassed in 10 years time when their trees are being ripped up it would be better <laughs> if we could stop them going in than yes it would be put them in and take them out again sounds like you know yeah, yeah it's not going to be good press for anybody is it if yeah that exactly yeah. yeah but like i said i didn't get i didn't get a listening i didn't get an, a, a good hearing i thought from him it never came back to me so uh okay okay we'll work on this together yes that'd yeah be, that'd be good yeah yeah okay i think unless there's any more questions we could um draw it to a close any more any more for any more or should we uh no. i think we're good that was really yeah. fascinating gara so thank you very much oh, indeed okay. yeah okay Down. thank you everybody